Hey guys, and welcome back to Just Ask Jason, our weekly devotional here at Berean. As usual, if this is at all useful to you, if this is a helpful video for you, we would love for you to subscribe, for you to like uh, our pages and our post here and share it with your friends and family. It's actually really helpful to us. It helps get the word out about our church, it helps get the word out about the various ministries that we offer, and it helps get some of our teachings disseminated out there in the public where they can be helpful to some people. So if you have the time, please like, please share, please subscribe, please do all that stuff because it really does help us a lot, and hopefully it's helpful to others around you as well. Now, here's the Devo. So we've talked about apocalypse literature a couple times before. We talked about it last week. We talked about it in this weekend's sermon. Uh, and actually, we've talked about it several weeks before that as well. And we know about apocalyptic literature that it's very foreign, that there's lots of Old Testament references. It's very culturally bound, and most importantly, that it's super, super symbolic. But there's something that we left out. Apocalypse literature tends to take on some characteristics of other types of literature throughout the text. So, for example, the book of Revelation operates a lot like a story. When you read it, it reads as though John is uh, telling a story about a time that he visited heaven. And that's called operating on a narrative Framework. In other words, Revelation has some characteristics that look a lot like a story, like a narrative. That's not the only kind of literature that apocalypse literature can end up looking like at times. Another one which it uses fairly frequently is poetry. Usually extended quotes in the book of Revelation are poems or hymns. In fact, in almost every single case, when someone speaks, they're speaking in a poetic manner or they're speaking a hymn. Hymns usually show up when there's a group of people speaking or singing in some form, worshiping God. One example is uh, Revelation 4.8, when a large group of people and angelic beings say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And that one verse is actually a very short hymn, or at least a piece of a larger hymn. The other kind of text that we'll see, as mentioned before, was poetry, which differs from hymns simply because hymns were usually used in public worship. Poems might be used in public worship, but not as a song, not as a worship chorus. They might be used, in fact, to teach. So let's talk about what poetry in the Bible does. The two main things, especially in the book of Revelation, that poetry does is First of all, forces us to slow down the quick-moving story of Revelation and focus on key details. So normally when there's a poem, it's almost as though John hits the brakes on this really fast-paced story he's been telling and says there's one or two things I want you to focus on. So that's the first thing poetry does. It makes us slow down and focus on the really important things in Revelation. The second thing that it does is it aids in memorization. Poetry all throughout the Bible is written in a way that has a, a cadence, a meter to it, a rhythm to it that makes it easier to remember. Sometimes they're written as, ac as acrostics. Sometimes they're written in ways where different words rhyme or have assonance. And unfortunately, when we read them in English, we lose a lot of that. The book was originally written in three different languages. It was mostly written in Hebrew in the Old Testament and Koine Greek in the New Testament. But there's also a little bit of Aramaic mixed in as well. Unfortunately, none of those three languages are English. So when we sit here in the 21st century and we read the Bible in our English translations, many times we don't realize when we're reading poetry and when we're not unless we know what to look for. But in the original language, these poems would have been written in a way to aid in memorization. The reason is that these sorts of passages either borrowed from early Christian liturgy or formed the basis of it. Liturgies is something you repeat over and over and over again in order to learn information. Think about how you learn the alphabet. You repeated it in kind of a sing-songy way 
A, B, C, D, like that, over and over and over and over again until you remembered it. That is a liturgy. And liturgy has a very rich tradition in Christianity. And these poems would have been liturgies. They would have been repeated or sung over and over and over and over again until you had them memorized. It was a devotional practice. It was a way of worshiping. Revelation 21.4 is a pretty good example of something that doesn't sound that great in English, but is very poetic when it's read in the original language. It's often translated, there will be no more death, no more mourning, crying, nor pain. Now that sounds really good, but it doesn't sound poetic. The Greek reads this way, Thanatos uk estai, Ete ute, pinthos ute, krage ute, ponos. When you read it that way, there's a couple different things that stand out and sound really nice. You have that os sound over and over. Thanatos, pinthos, ponos. You have this rhythm that's formed by the word ute. So after esta, it's ute pinthos, ute krage, ute ponos. And that ute over and over and over forms this kind of rhythm. It sounds like a poem because it is. It is a poem. And in the original Greek, it would have been really easy to memorize. So people would have memorized these long poems about Jesus and about God and about uh, the truths of scripture, and it would have helped them to internalize the message of the gospel. Last but not least, poetry appeals to our emotions. It contains rational truths, like that last verse that we talked about. It says that there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain when Jesus returns to the earth, when God comes to dwell with us. After the end times, there will be no more pain, no more consequences from sin. That is a rational statement. But the way that it's phrased is not meant to be broken down rationally. It contains rational truth, but that's not the point. In fact, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 says, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. In other words, he says, we are going to give you information. John does not have that sort of disclaimer statement here because his point in writing Revelation is not to give information about the end times to his readers. His point in writing Revelation is to inspire them to remain faithful to Jesus no matter what they go through in life. Biblical poetry makes you feel, not just think. John in Revelation 21, possibly my favorite passage in Scripture, although it has some competition with Exodus 33, but John in Revelation 21 doesn't need his audience to know that Jesus is coming back. They already know that in their heads. He needs them to feel it in their hearts, to feel it in their bones. And that's what this passage does for us. It allows analytical, critical, hard-nosed people to get in their feels and imagine what it will feel like when Jesus comes back. Passages and poems like this uh, would have been read, recited, memorized in ancient Christian worship when they gathered together in the mornings. Maybe it's worth the time for us to just sit and read it and feel what John intends us to feel. Awe, relief, joy, hope, and longing for God to come live with us. So here's the beginning of Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea is not any longer. And the holy city, New Jerusalem, I saw coming down out of heaven from God, having been prepared, having been adorned like a bride for her husband. And I heard a great booming voice from the throne say, Look, the dwelling place of God is with mankind. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and he will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no death any longer nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain, because the old things have gone away.